Um, our next uh, panel, we're going to bring out, you know, um, the stereotype of the cannabis consumer, of course, is the slovenly tie-dye slacker, but that, ne that isn't necessarily really where the consumer is starting to go. We are starting to see a real emergence in the luxury cannabis category, and so our next panel is going to cover that. Uh, we've got uh, some great brands here that have really targeted that luxury cannabis consumer. I'm gonna go get them and bring them out. Alyssa has a, a great background in the um, edible space, so uh, she's got a lot of experience with uh, food and beverage, uh, particularly beverage. So I will let her tell you about that, and then she will introduce our panelists. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Alyssa Jink. I am the manager of custom research and consulting services for Brightfield Group based in Chicago. Um, so I always love being able to come out to Southern California, especially in the winter. Um, but yes, I started at Brightfield Group um, a few months ago, and before that I was at Constellation Brands, um, and I worked a lot on our consumer research um, strategy and concept development for um, our project up in Canada with Canopy. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to talk about luxury edibles, especially in the last slot before lunch. So hopefully we get you all salivating um, over everyone's brands. Um, but before I start, I'm gonna introduce our panel really quickly. Uh, we have Yvonne De La Rosa from 99 High Tide, uh, Eric Eslau from <laughs> Defonce, Tracy Mason from Saka, and Estella Perez from Garden Society. So I have some slides that I'm not sure if they'll be up there. Okay, can you go to the next one? Okay, so uh, edibles have come a long way in the last 65 years. Um, obviously people have been ingesting cannabis for thousands of years, but um, in 1954, Alice B. Toklas published the official first recipe for hashish fudge. Um, she's, I think everyone um, has probably heard of her. She was Gertrude Stein's um, partner and she was also a writer. Then in the 80s, um, there was a renegade outlaw baker named Brownie Mary who started baking edibles for AIDS patients um, in San Francisco. And now today, since um, cannabis is increasingly becoming legalized for recreational use, um, this has really paved the way for some of the luxury brands that we're going to talk to today. So before we um, start talking to the panel, I'm gonna give a brief overview of the cannabis consumer because um, that's what I do at Brightfield Group. We have a lot of consumer data um, on cannabis and CBD users. And since we're talking about luxury, we're going to focus on um, cannabis consumers that make over $100,000 because that's the sweet spot for these kinds of brands. Uh, these kinds of consumers are younger, they are highly educated, um, a lot of them have families, and about 42% of them are women. Um, as you can see, these are some of our uh, Brightfield Group uh, consumer personas. The biggest groups are the liberal elite, um, which are highly concentrated on the East and West Coast, um, the typical stoner, which is just someone who uses cannabis every day, and uh, the single yuppies, uh, the newbies, which are more likely to be female, and the baked brownie moms, which are women who have children and who use cannabis pretty frequently and uh, mostly use edibles. Uh, next slide. So these consumers that are, um, have high incomes and consume edibles, uh, baked goods and chocolates are the, are the most popular among them. Um, the other categories are still fairly popular, but I think uh, baked goods and chocolate are what is really readily available in every dispensary. Um, it's easy to get access to, and some of these other categories are just smaller overall, so I think that's kind of explaining this discrepancy. Next slide. Okay, so um, this was something interesting in our data. These people that are making over $100,000, they're probably really busy. Uh, they probably have high-powered jobs. A lot of them, might, like I said, have families. Um, it's interesting to note that a lot of them are using five or more times per week, so they're heavy users of cannabis, um, but they also prefer lower dosage. So 46% uh, prefer that their um, edibles have less than 20 milligrams of THC, which is interesting, and I think this kind of speaks to uh, the trend of microdosing. So a lot of them might be taking a tiny bit um, throughout the day, a few times a week. Uh, but yeah, I think we're, and we'll probably get in, into this a little bit, talking about dosage. Next slide. 
And then, obviously, if you're a luxury cannabis consumer, price is not uh, going to be very important to you. Uh, these consumers rank taste and dosage as being more important than price, which makes sense. Uh, 30, about a third of them are spending uh, more than $50 per product, and almost half of them are spending more than $100 per month. And this kind of goes along with the trend that we've seen of um, edibles pricing uh, going up per unit. So I'm going to turn it over to our panel now and find out a little bit about how they decided to enter the luxury cannabis market and how they um, decided on their naming and brand, as, uh, which is very important um, in any kind of luxury products. So, Yvonne, you were one of the first uh, high-end dispensaries probably in the world. Um, I want to hear a little bit about what that experience was like, how you determined that that was a need in the market, um, and I guess how you ended up on your branding. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, you know, there wasn't anything back in 2007 that you could uh, actually take your mother to. Um, so that's, that was the inspiration be behind 99, which back then was 99 High Art, which we opened on Abbott Kinney in 2008. My mom was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2007. And, uh, you know, I did my research and, you know, I already knew a lot about cannabis and so I convinced her to use cannabis. And uh, she had never done it before in her life. She had never even had a drink in her life. So it took a little bit of convincing, but then I said, okay, let's go get your recommendation, mom. And then I said, okay, now let's go to dispensary. And it was really an awful experience because we went to many and in LA and, you know, it was the, the typical ones that, you know, some are still around today that, you know, had the bars on the windows and the little sliding glass window and they'd slip your application through and just made you feel like you were doing something wrong and you, that you were a criminal. Um, the first one I actually went to, there was a pit bull in the corner when we walked in that was like being held back and growling and I was... <laughs> I was kind of laugh at that because I'm like, really? And uh, so that's when I was like, and my, I've always been like this my whole life. Um, my friends call me a fault finder fixer where it's like I can go anywhere or do anything and I always find a fault in something, but not in a bad way, more in like, ah, I could fix that, I can make that better. And it was the same way for this. I was like, why isn't there a nice dispensary? Why isn't there like a luxury dispensary? Why isn't there one with art, you know? And like groovy and with like beautiful music and. And so then I set out to do some research and I was like, my God, you know, it was the time, it was the wild, wild west, you know, where everybody was opening up. There was no regulations, which was amazing. And um, <laughs> on so many levels. But uh, so we, uh, we found a location on Abbott Kinney and that's where we wanted to be. And it was, it was a really great time because we were, you know, able to do things that, you know, a lot of people uh, hadn't done, and that was just having a beautiful space. We, it was a, also a hybrid art gallery, a visionary art gallery, where we hosted a lot of um, famous artists, you know, that are even more famous today. And, you know, one of our first exhibits was Ayahuasca Visions, which back then people were like, what? But um, it was, uh, it was just a really beautiful space, and we made sure that when you walked in, you felt like, wow, this is, this is really nice. And, of course, the underlying, um, you know, drive behind it was somewhere I could take my mom to, somewhere that I would want to go to, somewhere my friends would want to go to, and, uh, you know build it and they will come. It, it's so true because sure enough, it was, it became like the be-in of, you know, the early 2000s or the mid 2000s where people were like, oh my God, this is a place to go, you know? And even back then, as far as product, we wouldn't just take any product. We knew our vendors intimately. They became our best friends. And so we made sure that we always had the best product. Even before testing came out, we knew it's like, oh, we we knew how things were grown. We knew where our cannabis was coming from. And um, 
And that was really important too. So people trusted us like, oh, this is the place to go for like the best. And um, we had a lot of events, which, uh, you know, like West Hollywood is allowing that now, but we had like the first cannabis lounge where we consumed cannabis. And uh, again, there was no regulation uh, back then. <laughs> so um, that's how it came to be. I mean, really it boils down to, I wanted to create a beautiful space where my mother could go to. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Um, Eric, uh, your brand was one of the first luxury brands in California, and so as a pioneer in the space, how did you decide to enter the luxury um, segment, and how did you choose Defonce's name and branding? And am I saying it right? Um, yeah, it's Defonce. Defonce, okay. Yeah, I'll start with that question first. So um, I started my career over at Apple, and um, if you kind of look at the names of all the Apple products, they're typically pretty boring, like it's iPhone, mm -hmm. iTunes, or Apple Music now. Um, so I kind of have that kind of DNA still in me. So we kind of looked at that and we just couldn't name the product edibles or I edibles. And I was just like, that is really boring. So we looked up French names and we, <laughs> so uh, Defonce actually means fucked up on drugs. <laughs> so, um, and if you're French, it's funny and it's not, it's tongue in cheek, but that's literally the translation of it. And I really like the dichotomy between something that looks really fancy and presents really well, and like Newsweek named it like one of the best products. And it's just hilarious to me that like all the French speakers are just like laughing when they read that. So, so, that, so that's, that's the name of the product. Um, and then for in regards to, I think the first question was like, how did we enter in this space? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't think it was an exercise of trying to create a luxury product. I, I think. Um, one of the things that I just learned over at Apple is that you just really care about making a good product and that begins with having truly high quality products in the process and also even the people. Um, so instead of like, you know, just hiring, you know, somebody that knew how to make brownies or cookies, we actually hired a R&D director from Cho Chocolate. Uh, one of my, it's one of my favorite chocolates um, out there that don't have cannabis in it. Um, and you know we source really good chocolate. Like our chocolate currently is, um, we source it from Belgium, um, and we just and it's not a play where you just create nice packaging and the product actually sucks inside. Like it's the package is um, is telling a narrative of what's inside. Like if you at any point of the um, consumer experience, you just point somebody, um, even if it's like you know like a like you know like like a good example. Like you know if you have your phone break like two months later. Um, it just doesn't, you don't fulfill that promise of luxury. So I think for me, it was really an exercise of just making a good product. And um, if it happens to be qualified or to be defined as a luxury product, it wasn't intentional, but I, I appreciate that it, it is, so. Okay. Um, and then Estella, can you tell us a little, about, a little bit about Garden Society's uh, origin story and how um, you ended up on a lux in a luxury focus? Absolutely. Hi everyone, I'm Estella, Garden Society. Um, so the name Garden Society actually originated from where we originated from, the root of it, the actual physical location. Um, and that's thanks to our founder, Erin Gore. Uh, she's based in Sonoma County. Erin has a corporate chemical engineering background. So she's traveled the world in her corporate past life, um, managing teams all over the world, Asia, Europe, America. And so needless to say, she was always gone. And meanwhile, she was still trying to maintain that, that good quality of trying to be a good friend, a good partner, a good daughter, everything, and realized that she was turning to cannabis just to help manage all the the chaos and you know in life in general, especially being a, a working woman trying to manage household and everything with that. So um, when she was able to come back home, she took the time to bond with her friends and started inviting um, her girlfriends over. Um, she lives in Sonoma County on a little micro farm. So all the women are gathering around why um, you know she's baking cannabis goods and as well she's experimenting with dosing because. Clearly she's a chemical engineer <laughs> and that's what they do. Um, so, and that's when it came, it came down to it, you know, everybody gathering and just, you know, binding together and sharing stories and she realized, holy crap, I'm not the only one going through this. Everyone has the same 
you know, trouble points and pain points. And that's when she realized that was the spark to, um, and at the time it was in 2016, so we're looking at, um, she realized that there's a need for uh, good quality edibles, a good quality cannabis, properly dosed so that the audience, her friends, could actually enjoy this and feel comfortable and safe. So um, right there in her garden in Sonoma County, these gatherings commenced, hence called the Garden Society. She wanted to create a community where um, women were able to feel comfortable and have an approachable product to go to. Um, so she created the community to destigmatize the cannabis um, stigma that it has, so that way it would welcome um, the people that were there, and hence, which is the reason why it uh, fits perfect into the luxury market, because that is our consumer right now. Um, women who, and I say women because that's how this originated, who appreciate a good quality, properly dosed um, product, yeah, and uh, combining that whole community of, uh, of just wellness and destigmatization. So that's Garden Society. Okay, thank you. Uh, and moving on to Tracy, um, can you tell us a little bit about the origin of Saka and who the consumer is and how it kind of became a, a luxury uh, brand? Uh, sure. So, I mean, I think some of the, the biggest components of luxury brands are all about a couple of very important things, one of which is, is authenticity, is that it's tying back to something real, a real narrative about the brand itself. And that narrative actually tr ties back to the founder. So in the instance of House of Saka, I'm, I'm the co-founder and the founder of the company, Cynthia Salarizada, who is here somewhere. Um, I, the, the notion of House of Saka is actually inspired by a, a society of ancient female warriors who once ruled the world and conquered all they desired. So if anyone's seen the beginning of the, of the most recent version of Wonder Woman, um, that's kind of the House of Saka. And these women were known to, uh, to rule the earth centuries ago, uh, primarily in, in East Asia and the Middle East, um, where Cynthia is, her heritage is, is uh, Persia. So having that narrative and tying that back to something very specific is really meaningful. Um, for us coming together as an all-female company, an all-female board, we felt it was important to really target the female consumer. Um, having you know, now worked for some of the largest cannabis companies in the world, I know that it's still a very bro-minded culture. I mean, people like Garden Society and, and what's happening at 99 High Tides are beautiful, but there's still a big still a big uh, mountain to climb there. So for us, targeting a luxury consumer, a consumer that's kind of curious, that we can benefit, that will reap the benefits from the quality of the product that's not only inside of it, but all, also outside, that's something that will resonate with them. Um, our approach to branding specifically was around very high art. Um, we wanted the package to appear and to be a true reflection, as, as uh, Eric said earlier, about what was inside. You know, we're using a state-grown Napa Valley uh, single vineyard Pinot Noir as the base for our beverage. We can't say wine. Um, we can't even say Pinot Noir, but now you know. <laughs> um, um, and that, what that's done is given us a fantastic foundation uh, for the product itself that, that I think really gives the consumer a beautiful uh, experience, very similar to what they would have if they opened a bottle of rosé when they came home from work. And uh, on top of that, the way that the product is dosed, uh, it's about five milligrams a glass. We, op we also have a proprietary blend of CBD in our emulsion, which allows for a nice body high that, that will complement uh, the sort of mental high that you get with THC. So um, the, the product itself has been really thought out from a beverage point of view. And when we launch our, our beauty products in the next couple of months, um, I think you'll see that same, that same notion reflected through that as well. Okay. Um, you mentioned like authenticity as a signifier of luxury. Can um, Eric, can you talk a little bit about what you think makes a brand luxury beyond just having a higher price point or fancy packaging? This one, this one works, right? Okay, cool. Um, so what are some of the um, elements of like a luxury brand? Um, I think one, um, and th it's been a common theme and the word's been used is, uh, you know, there's intention and also a narrative. Um, I could, um, so we'll talk, talk about the narrative first. Like, so um, it's, 
like not putting like lipstick on a pig and just it's really a matter of being very thoughtful about every decision you make uh, whether it's like the radius of the corners of the dust flaps in your packaging um, to like let's say like a you know where you source the walnuts or the almonds for um, a particular um, skew so I think having that um, a very thoughtful having intent in what you're doing and always just being very careful um, naturally just creates a narrative um, that a lot of people do appreciate um, the fact that I could tell you where you know the almonds are sourced and the you know and the person that owns the actual um, farm you know th those are things that like if, if you're very careful about your supply chain and you're very thoughtful about your products those um, it creates a naturally just a narrative um, and I think again I, the intention for us wasn't to create a luxury product um, but I think that the way that we go about creating products as a function just, just made it a luxury product within a cannabis space. Estella, do you have any thoughts on what else uh, makes a brand uh, high-end or luxurious beyond um, some of the things that have been mentioned? Sure, absolutely. Um, so it, it goes beyond just um, creating a product. It's also creating, um, Garden Society looks at creating a lifestyle that's aspirational and attainable also. Um, and it just, it's a feeling and it's a, a community that empowers women to give them the, um, the choice on um, what to, you know, let them feel comfortable with choosing a certain product so they can feel joy. And we're looking at what do these type of um, consumers look for? They, uh, they, clearly they look for uncompromising high quality. And with Garden Society, we for sure bring down, uh, it's, Transparency. So you know exactly we source from farms that we partner with that have the same values that we do. Um, we look at, our, I mean, our chocolates are fair trade, uh, loyalty. And then, so with the high quality that this, these consumers automatically go to, um, they want this positive experience also. A positive experience because... Um, from the start to finish, from the dispensaries that they go in to that they're part that we've partnered with, to what they you know our education formats that are out there, um, they want a great experience. So they're looking for high quality and great experiences, um, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Yvonne, can you talk a little bit about um, what consumers are looking for in? The, um, I guess, luxury branded edibles, and also what you're looking for when you're choosing what to stock um, in your dispensary? Great question. Well, our dispensary 99 High Tide is in Malibu, so we have a very discriminating clientele. Uh, I was looking at your pie charts, and I'm like, oh my god, that's us. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, well, with Eric, I, it's a lovely story. With Defonce, um, we are one of the first and only. I don't, I don't know if there's any other uh, all vegan dispensary. And uh, even though some of the brands here aren't all vegan, uh, we love Defonce so much um, that when we were like, oh God, you know, it's like, we're like, we're all vegan, we can't have this. We approached them and we said, you know, is there any way you guys can make a vegan product? And they did, they did for us. And it became one of our best sellers. And according to Eric, one of their best sellers now at almost all dispensaries. So um, that was very important to us. And I just wanted to point that out. Uh, so, um, but for us, what we look for um, being on the, you know, retail side, uh, in fact, we have all these brands at our dispensary, uh, not surprisingly. Uh, they, um, we, we look for, again, the highest quality products, super important. You know, consumers nowadays are, they're getting very savvy. You can't really like trick people and you shouldn't trick people anyways. Um, people, you know, are looking at, you know, the ingredients and in products, you know, they don't want palm oil, you know, it's, and, you know, especially in Malibu, people, you know, they know, they, you know, they shop at, you know, PC Greens or now Whole Foods. And, uh, you know, they, uh, they, they're label readers, so they want to know what's in their product. So that's very important for us. What are the ingredients? Um, 
Also, of course, the packaging. You know, uh, I started in the day where uh, <laughs> you would buy, you know, like Rice Krispie treats with like, you know, saran wrap and a ribbon. And it's like, wow, that looks nice. Um, so, <laughs> but, uh, you know, as things started changing and uh, packaging came into the picture, for us, it's very important. We've actually consulted with brands where we're like, oh my God, what great people. And, you know, their product, you know, has grown, you know, beautifully and organically and um, great ingredients and but my god their packaging is awful you know and we're like we can't have this on our shelves you guys but we'll actually sit down with them and go could you you know and again people have changed their packaging um, I wouldn't say just for us even though it was originally for us but I think it has helped them um, uh, and I think that's something we can all do you know and whatever you know, line of business we're in is help guide people who, you know, are trying to make it in this business who may not have all the exact skills just yet. And that's something that we like to do. We like to help shepherd brands. So again, packaging, super important. Um, you know, like Garden Society is just so lovely, so pretty when you see it. It's like, oh my God, that's so lovely. Defonce again, you know, it kind of feels like a upscale, uh, you know, Charlie and the Wonka, you know, it's like, ooh, the golden ticket, is it in there? You guys, eh? you, can, you can take that. You can take that idea, the golden ticket. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so that, again, those are, I would say, some of the most important things. And also, you know, where it's a, still a small industry, company ethics. If um, we get wind or, and we don't just listen to rumors, we look into it. If it's a company that is not, you know, ethically, you know, how do I even say that? Not morally, but, you know, just not with the ethics of what we believe in. Um, yeah, there's no chance in hell they're in our shop. So, um, Again, if you're a good company, good ethics, great ingredients, um, amazing packaging, uh, that's, I think, what we look for. Sam, anything else? That's my partner and husband, Sam. <laughs> um, right, right. So, you know... Again, we're, uh, you know, we're expanding. Uh, however, being in Malibu, again, we have very discriminating clients and uh, people come from all over the world just to go to our shop because, and I, I know there's a lot of, I don't know if there's a lot of uh, brand vendors here, but you guys would know. We're, we're very, we're hard. We're, I mean, we're nice, but we're like, oh, I don't know. You know, we won't just take anything. Some dispensaries, you know, you'll go in there and it's like, oh, like a warehouse of everything. Um, but we, uh, we have very specific brands that we carry. And I think that for us has been our success in the luxury category and upscale category that people, when they come to us, they know like they've gone through the rigorous process of getting through us. And if it's on our shelf, it's one of the best. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Having a discriminatory uh, <laughs> shelf chooser is important. Um, so Garden Society and Saka were both um, founded, it sounds like specifically for women, but I wanted to ask Eric, have you seen your consumer shifting more towards being female or has it always um, been more female? Because it seems like women are more drawn to um, obviously chocolate and then uh, on top of that, uh, more high-end packaging. Yeah, um, so it's naturally just always... Um geared more towards women. Um, my, what, actually, we, I founded the company with my wife, um, and she was the, I was still at Apple when we started the company, and she was a proxy CEO, because I couldn't disclose it to Apple at, the po at, the, at that point, and then, um, and then we had um, two kids, and she kind of backed away, and now she's actually coming back as a CEO, COO, which is great to have her back in the office. Um, but I, I think doesn't doesn't naturally. I think the product is um, I, again like I think our intent wasn't to go over or to try to target the female audience. But I think that some of the elements of the product um, um, is is appealing. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. And then for Estella and Tracy, have, since your packaging and branding is so female focused, have you had any trouble trying to attract male consumers, or are you not concerned with that? 
Uh, no, we're not concerned with that at all because <laughs> actually um, a majority, we've got a large population of, uh, I mean, percentage-wise of, of males seeking out our products for gifts. Uh, it's <laughs> for their loved ones or for their significance. And it's also, it's welcoming in the house. So if, you know, somebody's trying to go in, the male's trying to go in to buy something, you know, the, their partner, their wife or their girlfriend or their sister or mom or whatever are more susceptible to saying, yes, this is beautiful packaging. I mean, look at the pretty flowers on it. We welcome this into our home. So, yeah. So, no, we are, um, we, like I said, we uh, specifically are focusing on women. Uh, to empower them, and um, and this is well known with their partners as well, men. So yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna second that. I mean, when you're when you're looking at luxury brands, you know, the idea of of targeting a very specific target is what we've all done for as long as luxury brands have been luxury brands, and you know, and that means sustainability. And for us to be, for us, it makes more sense for us to really go after with the ruthless focus against the kind of consumer that we want to be part of our tribe, if you will, and then, um, and then give them what they want in a really beautiful way. I mean, I, when it comes bound, back to luxury branding, I mean, it's really about a ruthless, and I mean a ruthless focus on your brand standards. Now, whether that's the brand standards that live and breathe at 99 high tides and, and the values that they attach to that, or whether it's, it's our brand standards that say, you know, around price, promotion, packaging, positioning, all of those things just being completely uncompromising in how we approach those. You know, luxury brands don't go on sale. You know, luxury brands don't take bottom shelf positioning. Um, luxury brands bring something to the retailers that are meaningful. They're bringing consumers and they're bringing luxury margins, which are a beautiful thing. So um, for us, you know, we're happy to help encourage more consumers coming into the dispensary environment um, with, because they're seeking out our products. And, uh, and we're excited about the emerging female consumer in cannabis um, across the board. Thank you. So since we're talking about edibles, we have to talk about dosage and potency. Um, I always like to say that everyone has an edible story or they know someone who does where they had a bite of something, they didn't feel anything, six hours later uh, they wake up and they realize they haven't moved in like three hours or not, that doesn't hit them until the next day and they're at work and they're freaking out and have to go home. Um, so I think that's definitely, um, and the consumers that I've spoken to, a lot of them have been scared away from the category. Um, a lot of them are very wary of um, what they'll consume. And I think having obviously luxury brand helps with that because it probably puts them at ease a little bit. But how did you decide on um, dosage and potency and have you changed it at all since you started? Uh, Eric, let's start with you. Yeah, so when we first started, the, um, the milligrams of our bar were actually 180 milligrams and it was just a, it was just a be power pursue with Kiva. And it was just, because uh, we got so much pushback at the very beginning, um, of just being of equal dosing. Um, but I felt like the way that, per, like at, at the end of the day, it's like what the per serving is, right? So um, Estella brought this up about gifting, and I, I think one of the nice things about new products these days is that there's an opportunity to actually gift these products in the same way that you bring like a bottle of wine um, to a dinner party on Friday. So when we looked at our new SKU list, like we actually looked at that as not, not just creating products for for me to consume, but also looking at products that are giftable that I give to you for like, you know, let's say it's your birthday or for Mother's Day or whatever it may be. And then um, also for us to share. So, um, you know, those are the three consumption behaviors of any food product. So, um, so that we, when we looked at servings, we wanted the servings to be actually very controllable. So um, we have these little squares that are five milligrams and doesn't say that, you know, you could, if five is perfect for you, you eat five. If 30 is perfect for you, then eat six. Uh, nothing's stopping you from eating more. And, um, and the chocolate's actually enjoyable. So that's another um, good thing about our product. Um, but then we even have like super, super microdose where we have chocolate covered hazelnuts, which are one milligram each. So there's folks that like, you know, let's say two to three milligrams is perfect for them, or it's to get them, you know, to oh no, to power through like a total season on Netflix, you know, their favorite show. Um, 
so we looked at those occasions and you know we were, everyone's talking about like the new, the new consumer and if you're not coming up with new cons if you're not taking consideration new cons uh, new consumer consumption you're not really understanding or you're not really targeting that new uh, that new consumer so um, again we we looked at as low dose as possible our products taste good so it doesn't you know if they have to eat more or it's more normalized to food or snacking habits like i think it just makes it a lot easier to get over that hurdle and also prevents what you mentioned is overconsumption because you don't want that first experience to be a bad one tracy or estella um well i mean for for house of Saka, when we initially conceived the product our first prototypes we we were at um, a 20 milligram per bottle uh, for the still and a 40 milligram per bottle for the sparkling. We've actually um, changed that and that was really driven by, by flavor profile and what married to the base, the base wine product. And so we've increased our, um, our TAC to 25 milligrams and with another five milligrams of CBD, which really dramatically changes the flavor profile in a very, very positive way. So that equates to five milligrams per glass for a, five, a standard five ounce glass of, of wine that you, would, that you would have any day coming home. Um, the, the difference is with um, a, a, an infused beverage that's using nanotechnology, which is an emulsification that essentially makes uh, cannabis, uh, separates cannabis oil into tiny microscopic particles that become then um, self-homogenizing and, uh, and quote unquote water soluble. Um, and what happens with that is it becomes extremely highly bioavailable. So the, the, the TAC component, the CBD components, rather than going through your liver and having to be digested like a standard edible, so you're not really sure what you're going to feel like in an hour, you feel the effects of, the onset effects of, of, of um, of Saka wines in the same way that you would alcohol within five to 15 minutes. So it gives you tremendous amount of, of information, self-information on how to dose yourself. Um, so in, in rather than drinking a glass and realizing, oh my gosh, an hour later that you're really screwed up, you know, you're gonna know exactly how you're feeling as you're drinking the glass of wine. And then you can make the decision for yourself based on how you feel um, and based on what your tolerance level is. I don't know if you want to continue to have another another glass or two, just like Eric said. If you want to have a few ounces, just have a few ounces. If you want to have a few more, have a few more. That's um, the topic of uh, milligrams and dosing. Um, so with Garden Society, it's, it's very interesting because I, I see that uh, we've got two channels. We have a, a direct-to-consumer channel, um, and that's only in Sonoma County uh, because we have a micro-business license. And, um, and then we have a wholesale uh, channel. So our direct-to-consumer market, that's stayed the same as low. Milligrams, we have low-dosed products um, for our direct-to-consumer. And it's totally fine. Everybody loves it. And our core consumer, they don't bat an eye at uh, the price of our chocolates because of, uh, I mean, that's what they're spending on a bottle of wine or a yoga class or a spin class. <laughs> so it's, yeah, so they're just, they're looking for quality. But what we have done is in our wholesale channel, we have raised the milligrams. Um, so, um, so we see the low dose for our direct consumer and then a higher one when we're, when we're partnering up with our retailers. And I think that that's, uh, it's interesting because there, there's a, uh, there's, it's kind of like broken in the sense of, um, what buyers are seeing, uh, the consumers coming in and the conversations that they're having with them. Um, right now, it's just all, you know, milligrams, 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 um, high dosing. But I think that that's, and so that's different from what our target consumer is. But what I see and I strongly believe happening is that once the market matures, is that companies like Garden Society and Sock and everybody, they're going to be able to uh, gear this consumer that likes luxury, quality, transparent product to the dispensaries um, and, um, yeah, to drive to retail. So, so that's what I see happening. And uh, it's about breaking the stigmas. Um, so saying it's okay to have a good quality product, um, yeah, and get the great effect. So. 
Yvonne, can you talk a little bit about what your Malibu clientele is looking for in terms of dosage? Are they looking for lower dose or is it not as big of a concern for them? They want to get fucked up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, just kidding. Um, no, I, there are those that do. But, uh, well, we came up with something because, uh, you know, the consumer is getting, you know, uh, older, they don't want to get wasted, you know, and a lot of times, you know, we've all had those stories. I have many. Um, and, you know, including my mom eating an entire cookie that was in the fridge and like, oh, no. you know, 911, no. Um, I didn't call 911, she did. Uh, <laughs> and it's like, mom, that's the worst thing you could have done. But uh, so it happens and that's horrible. And, you know, you can laugh about it later, years later. But uh, so we came up with uh, five is fine. That, you know, in fact, we should probably start a campaign. If anybody else wants to, you can take it just give me a shout out. Uh, five is fine. Uh, that's what we found um, generally is good for everybody. So when people come in, you know, one of the things we're known for is our consultants go through a very rigorous process before they become consultants at 99 High Tide. And one of those things is dosage because a lot of people ask and we came up with, you know, five is generally fine. So five is fine. But um, there are people that, you know, even one milligram will send them into, you know, like outer space. So, but that's a rare person. So you kind of have to go with the general, um, you know, general public as far as like what is good. Like for Saka wines, you know, um, I think I have a high tolerance. I, I do have a high tolerance. But, uh, <laughs> but it's so nice to have a glass of wine, but you know, it's de-alcoholized, but, uh, and have it be cannabis and just one glass was fine. I remember, you know, uh, being at an event and having a glass of Saka wine, I was like, oh, this is so nice. But it's true, you know, after a little bit, I'm like, you know, I could have more. But other people w might be like, you know, I'm okay right here. That's great. Um, so uh, for us, it's very important to always, with every consultation, every single person that comes in our door, um, uh, we make sure we let them know about milligrams. You know, because even the experienced people think, I, I got this, and it's like, oh, no, you know. Yeah, I think as it, technology improves, that's going to become more, even more important. But yeah, five is fine. That's a good uh, slogan. I'm going to start telling people that. Five is fine. Um, so our last question before I open it up to the audience. Um, what has been everyone's experience with attracting investors and what are they looking for um, from luxury brands? Is it just the packaging? Is it the quality? Is it like your dosing technology that you talked about, Tracy? Um, let's, yeah, let's have Tracy start this one. Oh, investors. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that there's so much interest right now in the cannabis space in general, whether it's in the luxury space um, or, or not, that there's a fair bit of, of people who are interested in investing in the space. I think what, what really differentiates um, that investor and, and draws them in is the idea of, of something that's truly unique. And I know with, with House of Saka, the story behind it, the branding, the, the target consumer, the, the quality of the product itself, um, the background that I have in alcohol beverage for th almost 30 years, I started when I was really, really young, um, and, and Cynthia's background in uh, understanding how to really publicize within the, con uh, do public relations within the, within the cannabis space, I think has, has given us a fair audience. Um, and so a lot of people that, that are now coming in as seed investors are actually people from the alcohol space that, that um, are interested in now expanding into, into um, the cannabis space. So um, I think you know attracting investors is important. Having a great business plan, having a great brand, having good people behind you um, are the most important elements of that. Estella? Uh, yeah, I can, um, well, yes, uh, everyone knows that trying to raise money is very challenging. Um, that's why Aaron does it. <laughs> but um, um, I think that, uh, um, so everyone knows that there is a shortage of capital right now in the market for other reasons, but there's investors, new investors coming in on a weekly basis. And our experience is that these investors are looking for brands, um, which a brand like Garden Society, that has uh, growth potential and um, 
for not only in, the, in California, but in other states as well. They're looking for um, brands that will win customer loyalty through education, um, hence Garden Society. We have podcasts. We, um, you know, we partner up with community um, wherever we can just to share and create community. And they're also looking for um, innovation from our experience as well, whether that's in product services or, um, or both of them. Yeah, for sure. Eric? Um, so I, I think for Dave on say we had the benefit of starting before rec and things were a little bit looser so um, we're able to kind of bootstrap a few things but I, I like to date I think we've raised um, a little over 10 million dollars over the last four or five years that we've been doing uh, been doing this um, and I guess like to the root of the question I, I think uh, I think if you're to start an edible company today um, I wouldn't recommend doing it unless you had like $5 million and at least two years of runway. Um, just in the rec market right now with the regulations, with things that you don't even take in consideration, like the cost of testing and how you have to optimize for the batch sizes, um, the quality of um, employees you have to hire these days. Um, it's just an expensive endeavor, but um, when I first started, it was I was able to sell it as a I, there was a seven stock split at Apple. I was able to sell that and then start, start this. Um, but um, I wouldn't recommend doing it for less than five, just as a word of advice to anybody that's thinking about starting an edible company. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry, oh, yeah, for us, you know, as a dispensary, you know, and one of the oldest, um, we're also going to expand into our own line of products. And um, yeah, you know, currently raising money, I think what also expanding our dispensaries to only groovy places around the world. We don't want to be everywhere, just in the best. Um, I think what we've encountered is, uh, I echo everybody here, and especially Tracy, is just uniqueness. You know, it's becoming such a, you know, um, tourist industry as well, you know, people coming from all over the world, you know, at least for here, you land at LAX, you don't want to go to a generic place or, you know, some shabby place, you want to go to the best, and you want to go to a cool place and experience as well. So um, I think that's what, um, what really has been attracting investors as we're raising funds to expand is our uniqueness. And I think everybody here has that. Oh, definitely. Are there any questions in the audience? Uh, way in the back. Yes, you. You might have to yell, sorry. This industry is that there's almost like this dichotomy between legacy cannabis consumers you know, folks who have been using cannabis for a long time, even before the rec market, even before there were you know, medical marijuana dispensaries, and all the new entrants to the cannabis market, you know, the so-called cannabis curious folks who are just now coming into the market. And that there's some products that you know, cater to the legacy customers and some products that cater to the new entrants into the market. And even some brands are kind of staking a claim to say, look, we're for the new customer or we're for the old school customer. So I guess my question is two-part in that, one, does this mirror your experiences in that you tend to attract one or the other kind of consumer? And two, if that is the case, um, you know, do you think that there's a hope for bringing that legacy customer and convincing them of the value proposition of a licensed luxury cannabis brand, even though it's more expensive than what they're used to, and even though it's using kind of messaging and you know things that didn't always appeal to them in the past. Okay, so the question was about the difference between the legacy cannabis consumers, so more of the typical stoner person, versus uh, new entrants who are looking for more luxury, and if it will be possible to bring that legacy consumer into um, kind of a higher uh, price tier, more high end. Um, sure, well, I like to say that we like to consider ourselves legacy, uh, the Garden Society. I mean, because this is a uh, 2016 when it launched at the Emerald Cup, um, and it started with a bunch of uh, 
quote, quote, stoner women in a garden, right? So, um, <laughs> but just, um, but just a better quality. So I think being um, legacy and um, isn't really, being legacy shouldn't be uh, different from being a luxury product, be, meaning because people are now looking for high quality stuff. So we do have our OGs going to, because we do have pre-rolls and all of our pre-rolls, you know, sun-grown flowers. We stick to the roots of the earth. We stick to the, uh, the local farms and partnering with that. So to me, that's OG. So I, I, I was formerly the, the chief strategy officer and uh, innovation officer at Canacraft, which uh, produces an incredible array of brands across every kind of category within cannabis. And so to answer your question, absolutely there are brands that are highly targeted toward that legacy consumer, brands like ABX, for example, that really talk to that consumer that, that's, um, that's been in cannabis a long time. They want potency, they want quality, they want, they want innovation through different form factors, but nonetheless, they want that. And then on the other side of that, you know, there's brands like Saka and brands like Satori that are bringing new consumers. And so if we're looking for a bridge, um, I think the bridge is ultimately gonna be the other way around. I think as, as new consumers come in and become more educated, um, their tolerance level goes up with, with cannabis. Um, I think actually the, the, the can of curious will become legacy and not the other way around. And that's how I see that. And I, and I think that's what we all hope to happen is because that consumer is extremely loyal. Um, they're extremely knowledgeable. And so loyalty and knowledge when you're building a brand are, are two really important factors. So that's what I see happening in the space. Okay, uh, next question. Someone has a mic. My name is Greg Link, and um, I have a background in PR and marketing and branding for the past 20 years with brands like Patron and Too Faced Cosmetics and Dry Bar. And then the past year, I've pivoted to the cannabis and CBD space. And I have a lot of celebrity and high net worth individuals that don't feel comfortable going to a dispensary or having ease or delivery service come to their house. So I want your opinion in terms of the best way to reach those consumers and get them to want to buy your products, which I think they would obviously love. Well, <laughs> we actually have a lot of celebrities that come in in person because they like to. It's a very special space. Um, we also have delivery and we also have people's, you know, personal assistants come in. And I think, you know, if I understand your question, how do you get your clients to, uh, maybe I misunderstood the question, but. I guess, it's how do you, what, what's the platform in order to engage them um, to make them feel more comfortable um, as opposed to whether it's a delivery service or going into a dispensary? Because I've had numerous conversations. It's not really about my clients, it's more about a lot of people that I know and have access to and have had conversations, they're not gonna come to these kind of events, but they're open to coming to events, but obviously more exclusive. Um, I just don't know in terms of the regulations and the parameters in terms of how we could engage um, these, these type of people because they're very kind of curious and they consume cannabis, but mostly from people giving it to them as gifts. Right. Oh, I think that's how it starts, you know, is uh, them getting good products and going, wow, I like this. And um, I think it wouldn't be just for celebrities or upscale clients, if you will. But I think anybody that is kind of curious um, wants to feel safe and comfortable. And I think that goes back to, again, packaging, um, we, you know, and ingredients. Um, and of course, PR and marketing, it all, it's, all, it's all involved. But you know, we saw the change last July 2018 when you had to clear all your shelves from your big jars of weed and destroy it, which we did. Not. Um, we just 
destroyed it um, in many different ways. Uh, <laughs> but suddenly, like literally overnight, you had these big jars of weed in your shop, and then you walk in and it's all packages, and it was really weird. For me, it was hard. You know, uh, the transition, if you will. I was like, no, my God, the weed, I want to smell it. Ah! But then, you know, after a few days, everyone was like, oh, it looks really nice. It looks really clean. It looks really pretty. And uh, clients were like, wow, oh, this is, you know, there seemed to be more consumer confidence now that it wasn't coming out of a jar with tongs being measured. It wasn't, you know, so much like the old school candy store. With the, it was like, oh, here's, you know, a packaged item. So I think it goes back to uh, confidence in, in your branding, you know? Um, I'd like to add a little, um, just to touch on what uh, you're uh, referring to about. So um, I get it. There's some people that don't want to go into dispensaries, but like dispensaries like Yvonne's in Malibu, beautiful, welcoming. Uh, there's a lot of other ones out there. What Garden Society... Um, we kind of started on that basis because of the women. So we do hold, and right now I'm collaborating with um, a lot of uh, special deliveries, so we can continue our traditions of garden parties, which are private events. Um, so that's maybe something do you want to talk to me about later. <laughs> More than happy to, but we do. So I'm collaborating, we're collaborating that way, and um, we bring the education to private groups, and um, we have an open forum, we have a discussion, um, and with the collaboration under the regulations, we are able to partner where we have an actual, um, say maybe there's a coupon referral so they can go experience it, or we have a delivery service, um, you know, ready to go when they're ordered. So um, that's the kind of stuff that we do at Garden Society. Hi there, I'm Lisa Light, CMO of Can and Gather LA. And my question first to start with is for Yvonne. You've mentioned the beautiful experience when people come into your dispensary, but how do you get people there? What have been the most effective ways to bring in customers, the Can of Curious and others into the store? And also what do you wish that the brands would do to help drive traffic into, into your store? Wow, great question. You know, we're in Malibu, we're in a bit of a bubble, so, and we've always sort of been very rebellious in a lot of ways, and one of the things, and I don't recommend this to everybody, one of the things that we uh, have uh, done is to never advertise. Um, and uh, that, um, that I think has worked for us. It has uh, made people feel like, oh, it's like they're discovering something. And, uh, you know, in Malibu also, we don't, we don't advertise. Um, it's all word of mouth. And that's how we did it back in the day, because you kind of had to <laughs> on Avid Kinney. It's like, we didn't have a sign. We didn't advertise. It was all word of mouth. And those are the people who become your most loyal customers. Um, uh, you know, as far as bringing in more people, I mean, I'm not saying we're, uh, uh, we have, we've had a lot of stories written on us, a lot of media, but that's different than an advertisement in a magazine. Um, but I think to bring new people in, um, we do a lot of events. We're very involved in our community. We do monthly beach cleanups. We just uh, created a surf team. My husband was the captain for Surf Aid, which provides uh, you know, w clean water and health care and a lot of resources to rural areas where a lot of surfers go and, and they realize like, oh my God, these people, you know, are really suffering and here we are surfing their waves. So Surf Aid was created. So we do a lot of things like that, um, a lot of community things to, to put ourselves out there, not just in Malibu, but wherever we can. Um, very uh, charitable and socially active for us, I think has been, um, has been the secret to our success. And, and people read, people hear about us. And again, word of mouth, you know, I, I, there's nothing better than word of mouth, I, I don't think. Okay, I think that's all the time we have. Thank you very much. One last question oh. we'll take. Oh. Thanks, I'll make it really quick. 
Um, I am sorry if this looks a little self-promoting, but I wanted to mention, because this keeps coming up, people have a lot of concerns about over-consuming and overdosing, and there is a product that exists. If anybody wants to know about it, it's called Undo, and I'm happy to tell you about it. It helps clear your head in an emergency, it helps with a tolerance reset, and it helps with morning fog. And so if you've got the can of curious and you've got people learning about cannabis, they're a little afraid, or they're getting into edibles or the places where they ban edibles, this really helps people to learn how to use cannabis. And I think we have some of those samples of undo on the tables on the mezzanine level where lunch is happening now. So I wanna thank our panelists for taking time out of their busy day. Thank Amazing products that they have.